I'm going to be talking today about evolutionary medicine in the context uh, mainly of autism and, and schizophrenia. As Randy talked about, we can look at the contrasts here between conventional medical research and evolutionary medicine in terms of the differences between looking at proximate causes and ultimate causes. Conventional medicine looking at disease as breakdowns of the human body, whereas an evolutionary approach we focus on how and why disease risks have evolved, so we need to connect the maladaptations of disease with the adaptations that have gone awry. And the main use as a result of evolutionary medicine is that it allows us to generate novel testable hypotheses that would not otherwise have come to mind, and it tells us what data to collect. And I do want to stress that the two approaches are completely compatible and indeed synergistic with one another. Now, one of the key adaptations that has made us human, of course, is that humans are smart. We have big brains. We're not just smart. We're smart in a particular way. We are socially smart. So as a result, we can study variation in what's called the, the social brain, which is the main adaptation of humans. A considerable body of evidence from comparative primatology and psychology and neuroscience has told us that the large complex neocortex of humans has evolved mainly in the context of strong social selective pressures, giving rise to the social brain, the distributed integrated set of neural systems for acquiring, processing, and deploying specifically social information. So this is the adaptation that has evolved specifically in humans over the past six million years. We can abstract the social brain into a small number of what I would consider to be the core components. With these are traits that are either unique to humans or very highly developed in humans. Language, sense of self, as we just discussed, mentalistic skill, theory of mind, metacognition, Social emotionality, so there's basic emotions like fear and anger, and then there's complex social emotions such as pride, guilt, and embarrassment, and shame, and contempt. There's logical analytic skill, commonly deployed in social context, and complex long-term regulated goal pursuit. So we can see these as sort of the main components of the human brain of this adaptation that is so important for humans. Now we need to ask, what do male adaptations of this set of traits look like? First, we can look at underdevelopment of these traits of the social brain, loss of speech, reduced sense of self, low mentalistic skill, basic emotions may be present, social emotions are not, mechanical logic may be there, but not complex social situation logic, and a lack of goal pursuit. What we have just described looks remarkably similar to what is called autism, severe counter autism. There is no speech. These kids have a reduced sense of self. They tend to re refer to themselves in the third person or by their name instead of using I or me. Basic, um, they, they have a specific reduction or loss of theory of mind, as Baron Cohen's work has shown. They have basic emotions. They have mechanical logic, which is sometimes highly developed in the remarkable savant skills that you see in autism. And they have a general lack of long-term goals. Of course, traditionally, autism is defined as deficits in two of the core components of the social brain, social reciprocity and language, as well as restricted interests and repetitive behavior. Over the past, just the past few years, We've learned about the genetic basis of autism. We've known it's highly heritable. Now we know that there are hundreds or thousands of genes involved. These are not genes for autism. These are genes for the human social brain that can become dysregulated and give you a set of traits that look like autism. It's also important to note that autism represents a spectrum all the way from very severely affected individuals to normal people, especially normal scientists in the, in, in the technical fields. 
what happens when we take the same set of traits and dial them up? So we're thinking about these social traits as being a large pathway, a large network. Biological systems can be either dialed down as a rule or alternatively dialed up. Let's take these highly developed or unique traits and dial them up one by one. What do we get? We get language appearing out of nowhere. We get an extremely highly developed, overdeveloped, hyperdeveloped sense of self, megalomania, delusions of grandeur. And we get paranoia and social delusions. We don't have a lack of theory of mind. We have the opposite. We have people thinking that everyone has minds and is thinking about them. These are three of the core components of what's called psychosis. This is a, this is a set of traits that it's remarkably easy to kick the human brain into. Extremes of social emotionality would include depression and elation. Depression commonly invol involves high levels of guilt and shame and embarrassment to a high degree. We take logical and analytic skill and push it to a hyperdeveloped extreme. We, we have something that looks like thought disorder in schizophrenia, where you lose logical connections between aspects of thought and speech. We take complex regulated goal pursuit, dysregulate it, push it to an extreme, and what we have is the risky dysregulated pursuit of goals, which is characteristic of mania and bipolar disorder. And the goals that are primarily sought in mania in bipolar include the two great maximizers of inclusive fitness historically, which are, I'm sure you know what they are, sex and money. What I've just described is this, what we can call the psychotic affective spectrum, schizophrenia, schizophrenia schizoaffective disorder, bipolar, major depression, and borderline personality. Once again, we now know, for the past few years at least, that there are hundreds or thousands of genes involved. They're not schizo schizophrenia genes. They are social brain genes that have become dysregulated in a particular direction during development. And once again, as with autism, these extremes grade continuously into normality. Now what I've just described is, is a new conceptual basis, a new evolutionary basis for understanding some of the major human mental illnesses. We have a set of unique or highly, highly developed in human traits in the middle. We dial them down. We get something that looks like autism. We dial them up we get something that looks like schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression. So we have a continuum from one extreme to normality to the other extreme, from mechanistic cognition in autism to highly mentalistic cognition over on the other side. This idea seems logical, at least to me, but it is, it is a novel, if not a radical, idea in psychiatry, so it's worth having a little closer look at some of the evidence. This is some evidence from a variety of phenotypic traits contrasted between autism and the psychotic affective spectrum. Less attention to gaze in autism. Schizophrenics are actually better in their sensitivity to where someone is looking than normal people are. Reduced activation of social brain areas and the daydreaming resting network and the mirror, ne mirror neuron system in autism. Each of those systems hyperactivated, dialed up in schizophrenia. Decreased empathic skills, characteristic of autism, one of the core components. There is good evidence for enhanced empathic skills in people with borderline personality and mild depression people who are just uh, uh, relatively moderate way to the severe, severe extreme of this spectrum. Enhanced sensory visual spatial skills in autism, the opposite in schizophrenia. Systems of neurotransmission also exhibit diametric patterns. Hyperglutamatergic transmission is associated with epilepsy in autism. Hypoglutamatergic neurotransmission was one of the main theories uh, behind the alterations in schizophrenia. 
high serotonin in about 20% of kids with autism, low serotonin in affective disorders. We can also look at some genomic evidence over the past few years, copy number variation, that is variation among humans in number of copies of sets of genes in a contiguous genomic region has been characterized. So all of us, for a large number of reasons, regions in our genome have either two copies, the normal two copies, or we've lost a copy with a set of genes, or we have gained a copy. This provides a wonderful genomic experiment for evaluating these ideas. We have this natural variation, and this variation in number of genomic copies has been associated in quite a number of studies with risk of autism and schizophrenia, and these are often very, very strong, very penetrant risk factors. So I put all of the data from autism and schizophrenia together a couple of years back. There was enough data to do an analysis for seven different loci. So for two genomic regions, we had the, uh, this opposite pattern. For two other regions, we had the converse opposite patterns. So this is telling us that, well, within these regions, we have genes that are influencing social brain development. When you perturb them in the two opposite directions, you increase the risk uh, towards the two extremes that I talked about just a moment ago. There's a number of implications for this theory. The first is that it provides a new predictive framework for studying human mental illness. Traditionally, the people who study autism don't pay any attention to schizophrenia and vice versa. These, these studies have gone on basically in complete isolation from one another. Using this sort of framework, if we get some sort of, some sort of insight, uh, some sort of interesting pattern in one condition, we immediately know exactly what to do, what data to measure, what expectation and prediction to have for the other set of conditions. So all of the bodies of knowledge for each set of conditions can immediately be carried over to help and understand the other. So this, this approach structures research programs, it generates new hypotheses, and it provides reciprocal illumination of the causes of these two sets of conditions. Second implication is di diagnoses. Diagnoses are critically important. We want to be able to predict early to prevent, alleviate, or even cure these conditions. There appears to be a considerable problem in the field right now in that children who are what's called pre-morbid for later developing schizophrenia are diagnosed with autism spectrum conditions because this is essentially the only diagnostic category that is available for children. A child has a social deficit. There is no box to put them in that corresponds to, oh, they've got the sort of pattern that looks like they might, they're going to develop schizophrenia. So they get called autism spectrum. So we need to diagnose with more than behavior. We need to use genetics. We need to use biomarkers. We need to use diametric phenotype data. Here's some evidence from biomarkers. This is taking blood and looking, looking at a uh, pattern of various metabolites, uh, immune hor hormonal chemicals. And in this study, they were able to separate schizophrenia from Asperger syndrome with sensitivity and specificity each of 96%, even though they were only able to separate schizophrenia from controls at about 60 to 75%. So this sort of approach can provide for more effective diagnoses in childhood. Second, what about cognitive behavioral therapies? We all know that autistics should be taught to become more mentalistic and socially engaged. engaged. By this reasoning that I've talked about, we should help schizophrenics and other people with these conditions to become less mentalistic, to essentially become relatively more autistic in their thinking. There's also direct implications for brain training, a very large and growing industry. For example, for schizophrenics, they should be specifically enhanced for skills which are highly developed in autistics which should most directly bring them, bring them back towards the middle of the spectrum. Enhanced autistic skills, including working memory, visual, spatial, attention to detail, sensory abilities. It tells you exactly what to do to train them. 
What about pharmacological therapies? It provides a new rational predictive framework for drug development. If you have an agonist that works for one set of conditions, you should at least think about trying the antagonist for the other. One of the most exciting recent developments in psychiatry and the first use of the, the, the C word for cure in autism has come from work on Fragile X syndrome out of Mark Baer's lab at, at MIT. His work has shown that overactivity of the Emgler system is fundamentally important to Fragile X system. If you antagonize the receptor, you can essentially rescue Fragile X in mice. Fragile X is an, is an autistic syndrome, so there's expected to be carry, carry over to idiopathic autism as well. One of the most exciting developments in schizophrenia pharmacotherapy is the development of Emgler 5 agonists, that is, dial up the exact same receptor that you dialed down in autism. There is similar evidence, although less well developed, for the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor dial down in one condition, dial up in the other condition. One of the most exciting things about the Emgler receptor system is, is that these receptors have direct or indirect tie-ins with some of the receptors which are known to be of critical importance in the development of schizophrenia, which include the dopamine receptors and the NMDA receptors. So tweaking, pharmacological tweaking of this network shown here should provide an effective approach to treating both schizophrenia and autism, and it certainly provides new uh, targets, new ways of thinking about the development of drugs. So I've talked today about what has evolved in humans, the large social brain as our most important adaptation. I've talked about how the social brain can be maladapted like any other pathway. It can underdevelop or overdevelop. When it underdevelops, it looks like autism. When it overdevelops, it looks like the set of psychotic affective disorders. So we're connecting the adaptations with the maladaptations and the types of maladaptations uh, that you can have from perturbing the system. We're seeing psychiatric disorders as extremes of natural variation. I've talked about some evidence of diametric phenotypes, genomic, uh, genomic alterations, specifically copy number variation, and talked a little bit about implications for research, diagnostics, and therapy. And I think that this general approach of connecting adaptations with male adaptations with regard to society may, may someday allow us to get Darwin and Freud together, or at least on the same slide. Thank you very much.